everyone uh, and welcome to the latest in our superstar series. Uh, my name is Becky Hill and I have the great pleasure of being the statewide instructor liaison for Champions School of Real Estate uh, and I'm sitting in for Rita Santa Maria today uh, which um, I, I uh, have the pleasure of doing uh, but uh, certainly we uh, we would all love to see Rita and she will she will be back with us. She had some other commitments that uh, took precedence today, but um, we're very excited to have everybody with us today. And I know that uh, we're being seen across the state and on YouTube and uh, we welcome all of our uh, viewers today to this particular session. Uh, but we have the great honor of having with us today uh, Tamara Strait. Uh, Tamara, in her own words, says that she's a combination of innovation, hard work, and excellence. And as soon as uh, as soon as you meet her, I'm sure that you're going to agree uh, with that. Um, and so uh, I would like to. Uh, invite uh, Tamara onto the screen uh, and say, welcome, welcome, Tamara. We're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's an honor. And uh, let me just add a few comments uh, uh, just in the way of uh, introduction, uh, because we, uh, we hand select the people that are to be interviewed, and we certainly are impressed with you and the success that you have had in your business uh, there in, outside of San Antonio. Um, and uh, she she's an advocate for her clients, as you will see as we go through uh, a series of questions. Uh, but she also respects the, their confidentiality um, and finds that to be something that is paramount in her representation of everyone. And for our uh, students who are joining us from their classrooms this morning um, and everything, that is something that we also stress as uh, something uh, that they should be very serious about. Um, and you have a tremendous network of industry uh, partners, you say, that give you the, the resources necessary for you to uh, really be able to ensure that your clients' priorities are going to be met. And we look forward to hearing about that. Um, and it, uh, what our viewers may like to know is that what really drives you is your abundant faith uh, and your strong family values. Uh, Tamara is married with two children, a son and a daughter, I think uh, it is. And so, um, and uh, you, uh, you enjoy cooking, you enjoy cooking. Um, and I look forward to hearing about how you uh, share that culinary love with your children um, in the kitchen. Uh, but um, you also, I noticed that uh, from uh, one of your bios, I noticed that you come from a military background. Uh, I don't know if that means that uh, uh, you traveled a lot, if you got uh, transferred or PCS, as they call it in the military move of things. Uh, and uh, so we hope that you will share a little bit about that, because I know that that, uh, that has sparked a, a love of travel. Uh, in you as well. So um, on behalf of all of us here at Champions, I uh, just want to welcome you to the broadcast and say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to actually be with us uh, today. So um, let's just uh, let's just talk about uh, a few things that I know will be of interest to uh, our listeners <clears throat> and Tell us about when you uh, when you first started out in the industry. Uh, what were uh, what were one or two of the activities that you feel gave you a jump start on your career? 
Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I was thinking a lot about this question and the first thing that came to my mind was what I did wrong, actually. And the minute I got my license, I got a friend to hold my license for me. He was a broker and he was very generous and very um, willing, but he didn't he didn't practice real estate. So I, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to let him hold my license and I'm going to make more money because he's not going to charge me very much. And that was the biggest mistake I made because I spent the first two years kind of grasping. And so what I should have done is joined a big brokerage and probably joined a team. So I know I'm not really answering your question, but the really the thing that I did wrong was tried to save money. And I learned through that process that you actually have to spend money to make money and to gain experience also. And that means going to a bigger brokerage. That also means maybe going to a team and allowing someone to help you. Um, so that's really what I did after. The, I feel like my real estate career kind of took off on year two. And that's when I, um, I decided I wanted to do luxury. And that wasn't coming right away. So instead, to really jumpstart my career, I just helped whoever needed help. And um, I mean, I was in a, a closing one time with someone who didn't know how they were going to feed their family that night. And that was one of my very first closings. And I spent that closing doing whatever I could. I left that closing and helped them go buy diapers. So that was not what I was trying to do. I was trying to get into the luxury market. And that's not what happened. So I think to jumpstart my career, I was willing to help anyone. And that's what got me where I am today. And I still feel that same way. Luxury is not a price point. It is the service and the commitment that you make to your client. And, and I love that. And uh, looking at your website, uh, you emphasize that, that uh, even though you are branded as straight luxury, and I love the fact that you played off of your last name, uh, but then you really use the other word uh, to signify uh, sort of everything that you stand for not just the price point that you get the the opportunity to sell within in certain times but tell us a little bit about that as far as how did straight luxury come into existence well my last name um obviously is straight and so i was thought i was being very clever um and actually straight luxury did not do me any favors at first because Everyone and still several people to this day think I only sell luxury um, and I will get friends. My own sphere of influence won't call me because they're worried that maybe their house isn't luxury enough for me. Um, over the past seven years, people have learned that that's not the case. Yes, I sell luxury, but they've learned that to me, it is a luxury to have a roof over your head. And that's why I service everything. And that's how that came. I One day I said, I'm going to name myself straight luxury. And then six months later, I was going, wow, that was a big mistake because my friends aren't calling me. And that's who I really wanted to sell real estate for at first. But now I just kind of pers I thought about rebranding and I, I didn't. I persevered and just made it very clear what my mission is. And the people that know me and want to work with me, they know. They know. And uh, it, it's very clearly stated on uh, in your marketing and on your website that it uh, luxury means more than a price point. It actually is the whole experience of working with you because of how dedicated you are to their needs and how focused you are on what it is uh, they are looking for. So I commend you for that. And, you know, we talk about in a lot of our classes, we talk about uh, the importance of branding and finding an identity for yourself. And you have done that within a very uh, a large, well-known brokerage company there in the San Antonio market. Uh, Phyllis Browning Company has been around for many, many years and is highly respected in that market. And it's, it's always great when you have, uh, when you can be your own sort of entity within the company. And so that is great that you have a broker that understands the importance of the personal branding because that is something that can carry you throughout your uh, real estate career, uh, can carry you throughout your real estate career. Um, let me just ask you something because you brought up uh, team 
but do you actually have a team yourself? I do not. No. So I have, um, I have an assistant who is licensed and she can help me show open doors occasionally. And she helps uh-huh. me behind the scenes. And then I have another girl who works under the straight luxury umbrella, but we're not a team. We don't split production. It's not volume based. Really what that allows me to do is not turn someone away if I'm too busy. Um, I'm in a position where I don't want to take on more than I can handle because then that's when you get burned out and you're not doing the best that you can. So if I get a phone call and someone wants to live by or sell, I don't want to turn them away either. Um, sure. Especially if they specifically want to work with straight luxury. So I have a girl who I can give those clients and get a referral from her. So that way everyone is happy and and honestly that way i'm i'm still making sure that the client is taken care of because i know who's taking care of her i understand uh and so essentially you have working partners uh, right. that you, that you can rely upon in your business and certainly that's a beautiful alternative uh to a team because it's like having a team without really it being a true team but you've got each other's backs and right. uh so um, I know that uh, early, when I was not early in my career, but uh, later on in my career, I had a working partner always, and it worked beautifully because we backed each other up. So uh, that's good for our students uh, to hear and everything, that there's different ways to approach the whole concept of a team. It doesn't have to be such an organized effort. But the main thing is at the end of the day, you've got to take care of the client and what they need and that's what you're providing you're providing that level of service so that all of the prospective clients get well taken care of and you trust those other people uh, to handle the business similarly to the way you would so i commend you for that thank you uh, uh, let me uh, ask today uh, i know when we were visiting a little bit um, you were talking about how the market uh, was changing how are you uh, marketing yourself today uh, compared to how you marketed yourself during COVID because we were talking how that has changed. Yeah, Can you so share that? that's a great question. You know, COVID changed everything for everybody and basically overnight, <laughs> nobody was prepared for it. Um, uh, I, we were told to stay home on, I guess, March 14th and flatten the curve for two weeks. I started working April 1st and I haven't stopped. I stayed home for two weeks and that was it. And it was, you know, at that time I was like, well, we got to take what we can get because we, we don't know if anyone's going to buy or sell. And so I got to the point where I almost didn't have time to market during COVID. So everything I was doing pre COVID there was because everything your listing didn't last. It was sold, you know, instantly. Um, The buyers were coming without having to, really market yourself, at least in my situation, because I work with a lot of friends and family and referrals. And I was as busy as I could handle. So the marketing during COVID, it was, I still stayed on social media and marketed that way, but I, and I still did print in Homes and Land magazine, um, but it wasn't as crucial then, which I hate to admit that, but it's the truth. Um, so now that COVID is over, I'm having to reevaluate and say, okay, now what are we going to do? Because we're really going back to what I think is more of a pre-COVID market. Um, houses are sitting longer, especially. They're definitely not every not every house is selling in 24 hours with 10 plus offers anymore. So I um, I'm going back to print marketing. I really truly believe in that. And that's postcards and that's magazine. Um, I do, you can see here, I do homes, um, Cowboys and Indians. I do love Home and Land magazine. I like that because it's local Um, and social media. The social media is where I get at least 50% of business. So I, that's something I never stopped um, and I will continue to do. It's, it's really been beneficial for me. And and on your social media sites, are there certain social media applications and sites that you prefer that you use more over others that you feel brings a better return on that investment of time? Yeah. So I don't don't 
feel to be on TikTok and because honestly, social media can also be time consuming and can suck you in. And then next thing you know, you aren't spending time with your family or, you know, getting anything else done. So I do Instagram, which feeds to my Facebook. And then on top of that, YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. It's not big by any means, but every house that I film, I put it on there. So that way they all kind of link together. And if you want to see my past work, my current work, and even my interviews, um, I think it's important. I've done some realtors, um, some interviews with realtor.com. I've been um, pranked by Bobby, well, Lunchbox from the Bobby Bones show. So all that's on my social media so that you can see what the network that I can reach and what I have done. And that's all marketing. Well, wonderful. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Um, can you share uh, with our audience about how many um, uh, hours or days uh, a week that you devote to your business? That's also a great question. In fact, I wrote on my notes, how many hours? <laughs> More than I probably should. That was my, <laughs> that was my answer. But you know, it, 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 it differs. Um, everything comes in waves. So there's some weeks I'm maybe working 20 to 30 hours a week when it's kind of slow. Um, but when it's busy, I take it and I, I ride that high wave because you just never know. And I'm working 40 plus hours a week, obviously, because, you know, in real estate, you, you don't have business hours and you don't get to stop at, at five o'clock. So when it's busy, which the last two years have been, I'm working more than 40 hours a week, whether it's marketing, inputting listings, working under contract. And it's so to answer your question during a busy season, over 40 hours a week. But there's some weeks where I can, you know, get by with 20 to 30 hours. But you've achieved that great balance of business and family because you still care so deeply about your family. Uh, tell us how you spend some quality time with your family, uh, particularly with those sometimes longer hours that sometimes you're required to keep. You know, my goal is to try to get all my my work that I know I need to do done during the hours that my kids are at school. So that way when they come home, I'm present and I'm cooking. We eat dinner around the table every night. We do not eat dinner with the TV on and in different rooms. We are sitting at the dinner table. Um, the TV is off unless the, like the World Series is on. <laughs> um, but it, I make it, the other thing that I do is I make it very clear to my clients how important my family is to me. And sometimes my kids have to go open a house with me or go to an inspection with me. And my clients know that up front. And if they don't, if that's going to be a problem, then we're probably not going to be a good fit to work together. And so if I can get everything done that is computer work, paperwork, um, marketing done during school hours, then the only thing I have to do when they are home is take the, the occasional phone call if we're under contract or something is pressing or we have repair amendments to do by five o'clock. Um, that way I'm not trying to work from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed. But uh, I know when you and I were visiting earlier this morning, uh, you mentioned that you tr you try really hard uh, to be focused on your family when you're at home. You don't let that, the phone is typically off um, unless you said like you've got a pressing contract right. negotiation or something uh, taking place. Um, so when did you decide that that was an important way to, to handle the balance of uh, business and family? COVID. COVID got me so busy that I was on the phone all the time. And when your kids say, you're always on the phone, <laughs> that really kind of stings. And so um, it wasn't until probably last year that I learned, you know what, put your phone on, do not disturb when it's family time. Um, unless, of course, I'm waiting on something that's time sensitive or pressing. But you sure. have to create those boundaries early. I'm playing catch up because I create those boundaries early. Um, but it's important. And you only get one chance at this life with your family. So, 
<laughs> uh, let me ask you, because I know that um, uh, you you were mentioning earlier uh, that the market in San Antonio, uh, so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the market in the San Antonio region and how that is changing. And if you could just add a few comments about when, like last year, when the market was so robust and so overwhelmingly a seller's market, how did you deal with buyer clients with the multiple offer situation, if you had the buyer yourself. So touch a little bit on the San Antonio market in, in general, if you would, and also the best way to deal with buyers who might get disappointed uh, when there's multiple offers. Sure. Great question. So I'll start with what I did with buyers back when the market was robust, which again, the market is still great, but it's just not what it was last year. You know, one of the things that I had to make the buyer understand, everybody knew that there was going to be multiple offers. Everybody knew that they were probably going to have to offer over asking. So my job was to say, what is your actual comfort level of over asking before we even get started? Because okay. if, if they're okay, if they're, you know, if they're really their top dollar is 550, then you really need to be looking lower than 550, right? Um, and the other, the other part of that piece was if we got into a multiple offer situation and the listing agent came back to me and said, okay, I'm going to give you a chance to come up. And I know now my client is at their max or what they were comfortable with. My response to them was, is this the house? Because this, if this is not the house, then don't do it. We can find something else. It's don't make yourself go even higher out of your comfort level just because there's competition because when there's competition it makes everybody want the house more right so it was a matter of where's your comfort level and is this the house the other thing that i did um a lot and actually i secured several houses this way last year was everyone is looking at just listed you know the realtor.com thing pops up and it's just listed let's go see it right away so i would get my buyers and say hey Let's go look at a house that's been sitting on the market for 14 days because 14 days was unheard of in 21. So we were actually able to secure several houses for buyers or I was that with that method. This house was sitting for two weeks. We probably don't have to offer over asking, which was but it made my heart feel better that they weren't offering over asking. And maybe the house needed a little bit more work. But guess what? We're not up against 10, 20 different people. So that was very um, a very successful way to purchase homes for my buyers last year is looking at stuff that wasn't selling right away. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that's an important point for um, our students to remember and getting started in their careers and everything uh, if, because the, the market's always going to run in different cycles. And uh, we've had the, We've had the the opportunity to enjoy a pretty long sustained seller's market for the last several years. Last year sort of blew the top off of everything uh, with all of the multiple offers and the crazy amounts that people would pay above the listed price. But I find that very interesting that you found a way, okay, in your own way to help your buyers still be able to find a property that they uh, that they liked by looking at some of the things other than the, the ones that had just hit the market. Uh, that's really smart advice uh, for our viewers. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you sharing that uh, because I know there were lots of buyers that got frustrated last year. Um, and <clears throat> if you stay in the business long enough, you learn that the market is going to run in the cycles up and down, up and down. And you have to be able to deal with every type of market. Uh, not just robust sellers, but also sometimes a, a buyer's market where the sellers are the ones that are frustrated uh, right. more so than the buyers. Um, let me just ask you then, uh, that gave us some really good advice on buyers. Uh, tell us, uh, because you're, you've indicated that the market is starting to slow down, starting to shift a little bit there. So what are you doing uh, right now to prepare your sellers for a shifting market when maybe they are thinking that they're going to get more, 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 and uh, they may not want to listen to your advice on the price, uh, the price range that they could conceivably uh, expect. 
That is a very good question because it's what I'm literally living through right now. And unfortunately, the sellers that we all have right now are living through this market shift and it's shifting every day. It's not like if I get a new listing, I'm not going in there and saying, okay, this is what's happening right now. I'm going in there and saying, look, we are kind of changing by the day and by the week. So your expectations have to kind of be flexible um, because I don't think we even really know what market we're in right now because we're in a transition, right? The problem I'm having is, and I, I think probably every realtor could speak to this, is even though we're telling our, market, our listing, our sellers, that we're not in the 2021 market anymore, they don't really believe us still because we've, we've had it for two years. Pretty much. So how do you just overnight quit that train of thought? And so um, I'm still pricing things a little bit over where I think they should be. Not on purpose. Um, I probably shouldn't really be saying that. But it's the truth because they're they're still stuck in the 21 market. And no matter what you say, they right. can't really understand it. And I don't really blame them because it's kind of happening very quickly. And I mean, even the first three months of this year were better than what we have are in right now. True. So, true. So that's what Pardon? I said that's what I'm hearing from across the state. Right. Uh, from uh, from uh, uh, agents that we have in in some of the designation classes and all uh, that I get the pleasure to teach. We have uh, students. We have uh, agents from all over the state and sometimes other parts of the country as well. Mm -hmm. And that is the message that we're getting over and over again, is that they're starting to feel uh, the slowdown. And it's really, it wasn't at the very beginning of the year. It's more in the second quarter of the year. And now, you know, moving into the third, we're in the third quarter of the year now. And we've got the startup of school and everything. Do you think that the beginning of school ha has a little bit of an impact on the market in your area? Does it seem to not have an impact there? I think it does. Everyone is trying to get their last minute vacations in just like in a normal summer year that we have. Um, but the main thing for sellers to understand today is we are living the cha the market change right now. Yeah. We don't, we don't, we aren't even settled in the new market yet. We're, you are, if you are listed right now, you are literally living through the change. So you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to adjust. And um, really trust that your agent knows what they're talking about if they're trying to walk you through this market shift. Because every day that I wake up, it's a little bit different for us, too. And I'm having to get my sellers to understand that. So um, it really well, is different right now. Uh, it is different. Uh, but let me just share um, a couple of, of thoughts from some of your clients. Uh, because one of the things that you have are client testimonials on your website. And that is so important uh, for every agent out there to get clients who are willing uh, to make comments about you and let you share those on the um, Internet. And I won't mention names or anything, but I just uh, highlighted a couple of things. Um, and these are it says what my clients think. And these are just statements from different clients they talk about you being very determined and professional uh, as a young lady, and they can't overstate uh, their pleasure on how you handled their home sale uh, and all. And then this is the other one that goes back to your uh, the comment you just made. Uh, they Their comment was your marketing and your knowledge of the real estate business is amazing. Instead of being stressful, you made it fun and seamless was the comment that the, they made. Can, can you talk a little bit about what you do to alleviate the stress that uh, someone has when they're a, a seller or a buyer? Because it can be very stressful on both sides. Right. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not all, it's, not, it's not always fun, but, um, you know... <laughs> I create a relationship with my clients and we really do have fun. And I mean, I think the, the number one thing is for them to trust me. Right. So, and when you trust someone, then you kind of feel like you've gotten to know them. 
And it doesn't mean we're going out to dinner every week after closing, but we still have created a bond. And um, I have a client who moved from Arizona. He's 80 years old. And now I'm on a group text with him and his kids. Um, <laughs> that's how much fun we had and how much he trusts me. And, and it's when I say fun, it's not because we went and did something fun. It was because the conversations were always trustworthy and I made them feel comfortable, which made them get to know me, get to know your client. If you get to know your client and truly show that you care about them, it's going to be fun. Even if you're not going and doing something fun. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Yeah. It's all about the relationship. Uh, and uh, obviously you work really hard and you seem to be just a natural at at being empathetic about what someone is going through and wanting to really just uh, meet them where they are in their personal lives. And that's the reason uh, the straight luxury means so much more than a price point because you do deal with various different price points uh, as your uh, marketing materials uh, indicate. Um, let's shift uh, focus a little bit and let's talk about technology. OK. Um, and during the last uh, couple of years, uh, has there been um, new technology that you've incorporated into your marketing or um, uh, any new practice that you think has um, increased your production at all? You know, I thought about this question and the honest answer is I'm not a super tech person. I'm kind of old school. Um, the only technology I really use other than like dot loop, right? To hold all my files. I don't have a, I don't want to say this because everybody should have a CRM. I don't really have one. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to get one this year though, but it's the technology truly is my social media. That's the only technology that I use because I can't stress enough how important social media is in this business. Um, do I enjoy it all the time? No, it's, it's a lot. But it's so important to expose your clients' homes for your buyers to get to know you because that's what makes them want to work with you, right? And it's a free, it's a free way to advertise your business, your listings, your services. It's free. I mean, it doesn't cost you a penny. So as long as you know how to use Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever platform it is, um, it's only it is it's only going to boost your, your presence, your brand. Um, I did. Um, the one thing I did try to do last year was hire a company to take over my social media. So that was something I tried and you know, um, it didn't work for me, not because they weren't doing a good job, but because I was seeing less of myself in my posts. Oh. And because on my social media, I'm very, I'm kind of unapologetically me. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing. And um, I'm not scared to talk about my faith. Um, occasionally my family's mixed in there and then I talk, but it's mostly real estate. And what I tried to do to free up my time by hiring a company, um, it actually, all it did was make me realize that, that the social media is what I needed to be doing. That was kind of my niche when it comes to my brand and my business. And so what I thought was going to make my life easier was not. So that is one thing I tried. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and uh, the comment about a CRM for uh, some of their students in class who are just starting uh, to take their classes, they don't know a CRM from a PhD probably. Uh, so uh, a CRM uh, that uh, Tamara is, is mentioning is a customer or client relationship management. Uh, it's like a software program uh, and basically it's an app. It's an application today. Um, and there's tons of different companies out there that offer that type of service. And um, as the, as people are, are, as newer people coming into the industry are out interviewing with companies, that is a question you should ask. Uh, you should ask those questions so that you know what services are going to be automatically provided to you uh, by your company and getting started 
uh, the more things that you can get for free mm -hmm. <laughs> that you're not having to spend a lot of your own money on, um, that is sort of the, a good way to get started so that you realize the importance of some of those types of, of marketing tools. And the, the uh, client relationship management tool just helps streamline <clears throat> your operation so that um, it can, it, it's sort of like having something that is thinking for you and, and not necessarily doing the work because there's still programming that has to take place sure. uh, in that CRM program. And you have to have your database as part of it and everything else, but you can program it to send out messages on a regular basis. Uh, but, I, uh, but it's interesting that you mentioned that you hired a company uh, to do your uh, social media and after using them for a while, it, it just wasn't you. It didn't come across some of the things they did good things, but some of the things they did, it was like you were losing, losing part of you. Uh, uh, Tamara's own personality wasn't coming through in some of that. And, uh, you know, the one thing I, I know, uh, uh, having been in the business uh, for as long as I've been in the business, uh, many, many years now, uh, but I know the one thing you have to do is always be genuine mm -hmm. uh, because people want to work with you. Your clients want to work with you because you are genuine. And as you mentioned, it sounds like you're pretty much a straight shooter too. Uh, uh, you, you <laughs> don't necessarily, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you don't necessarily, you, you have your own views of things and you're, you're proud of, of your faith and, uh, the fact that uh, that is a, a part of the foundation uh, for you and your family. Um, and I noticed it, that you actually have a monthly uh, charity, I believe, that you support as well. I do. Um, thanks for bringing that up. That's sweet. So it, I take the summers off because I'm spending time with my family. But um, during the school season, which is <laughs> September through May, I design a new shirt every month. And I have partnered with Bunker Branding, which is a local um, merchandise company in Bernie, which is where we live. And they print the shirts and mail them out for me. So my goal there was to stay to support a small business. I'm very big okay. on that. because I grew up with my dad, um, a single dad doing a small business. And so every month I pick a different charity and I give 100 percent of the proceeds from the sales of that shirt to that charity every month. And the one thing you can know is the shirts will always be faith based. And mm -hmm. um, the charity is just kind of random. Um, if someone have, has an input, I'm happy to listen to the input and give to that charity. But I keep zero dollars. In fact, it actually costs me money every month to do this because I have to pay someone to design the shirt. I design them, but they set them up. But yeah, mm -hmm. so every month is a new shirt, a new charity. And all this, all the um, proceeds go to that charity, and it and it blesses me so much to do that. And I'm not just and, saying. Yeah, and uh, you can find out a whole lot more about that if you go to straightluxury.com, which is Tamara's website, because that's certainly how I found out yeah. about it. And I thought, I thought it, it's such an important part of being a business person is also supporting the local community and giving back. OK, because obviously the business has blessed you. And so you have found a way uh, to share those blessings by giving back. So uh, we commend you uh, for doing that and encourage, you know, people that are listening, uh, other students and all that are listening uh, to find something that you can also participate in locally, uh, mm -hmm. because that will uh, that will come back to you. Um, in uh, terms of other business. And that's not the reason you're doing it necessarily, uh, but it, it, do, it does end up happening. You do end up with uh, more business opportunities as a result of that. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that it wasn't a part of the, the necessary, the questions that uh, we uh, try to impose, but I, I think it's uh, good for our, our listeners to know that being a top producing agent means that you also have to have that balance mm -hmm. and you have to find a way uh, to sort of spread the wealth or uh, to give back. And you're, you're doing it in a, in a very unique way. And uh, I, I commend you for that. Thank you. Uh, 
let me uh, ask uh, you uh, this question. Uh, was there, is there any single involvement or defining moment um, that you can think of uh, that uh, made you realize that you could be successful in real estate? So I, I thought a lot about this question. And the first thing that popped in my mind for the answer to this question was actually when um, I was selling a house to a newlywed couple and it was a, gosh, I think it was a two or $300,000 house. And the excitement from my buyer was the biggest, the most excitement I've ever seen, more than any of my clients buying a multi-million dollar house. And the joy in their eyes and the, um, I don't know, it was so raw. That was when I knew I had made it, truly, because I was watching her and her house was not a million dollar house. And I've had several clients buy million dollar houses and they're happy, they're super excited, but the joy in this couple that's what made me realize what I was doing was worth it. And that's when I felt like I had made it. it and, and that was, gosh, probably over five years ago. And that's the that's what popped in my head when you said, is there a single, single defining moment that I realized that I had become a successful real estate agent? And it was, it was that. Um, on top of that is, I guess, my, last year. Um, I tripled my best year ever last year. And it wasn't on purpose. It was um, all natural and just kind of pain. And that last year, I really realized, wow, I kind of have a good business going on. And I'm so grateful. And um, I don't, I'm not very proud of myself, but I was kind of proud of myself for the first time last year. Well, I, I think you've proven yourself uh, in the industry um, and everything. Uh, it, it's interesting. I have a, a comment in chat from uh, uh, Chris Traver <clears throat> uh, talking about it. it says straight luxury. Tamara, straight realtor and her team, particularly Pam, flawlessly took care of my parents on their purchase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when uh, when you can get comments like and that's someone that's just tuning into the broadcast right mm -hmm. now uh, that is making that comment. And so whenever you have. Uh, people that appreciate what you do um, and that will share, they will spread that word. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons you were so successful last year is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the word of mouth marketing that you get from your clients. Can you uh, speak a little bit about that? Yes, especially to new agents. Really and truly word of mouth is your number one marketing tool and it's free it costs you nothing well it costs you time and hard work there's a price for that right our time is valuable but just doing a good job and having someone that will refer you um the other day i had um someone that i know really well she called me and said i know a lot of realtors but my sister needs a realtor and i chose you because i knew that you would fight for her and that was huge. It brought tears to my eyes because this particular um, friend of mine does have a lot of realtor friends and she picked me. I mean, I'm not even worthy of that, but she still picked me and um, I will fight for you. And she knew that about me. So I think it's so important for your clients to have a good experience and also get to know you because then they're going, they're going to refer you and referrals cost nothing. That's right. Uh, and this is a comment from another client. Um, that says she exceeded our expectations in every way. She's even continued to follow up after the sale of our home. And they went on to say, we will continue to use her services for years to come when, with buying and selling. She is the best, all in capital letters. So um, uh, obviously, I mean, you're very, you're very humble by saying that uh, uh, you, uh, you don't know why. Um, I think that innately uh, you're doing the things, um, you know, the importance of discipline. Uh, you saw that with the part of the growing up in a military family, because that's certainly part of it. But you also saw the importance of showing appreciation and, and hard work and discipline 
and appreciating other people all come together to make a, a great real estate agent uh, because you're obviously focused more on them than you are on yourself and the commission. So we talk about that in classes all the time, how you can't be focused on the commission. If you do your job properly, if you exceed people's expectations, the commissions will come. Right. Okay. But uh, uh, so I, I appreciate um, how modest you're being because uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into uh, to getting into any type of market uh, but particularly sometimes getting into uh, like the luxury home market. And um, I know that you that you say that that is not the <clears throat> the only type of market that you address. But can you tell us a little bit about how you first started getting into selling luxury homes, the higher priced properties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I remember. So I remember the first two years I was kind of drowning because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but that second year I got a, a really great listing and it was my first uh, million dollar house. And I didn't have a whole lot of money to throw into marketing, but I didn't care. I chose to do that. So I took that one, my first million dollar listing and I threw a very big open house and it was an evening open house and I had food and music and I had um, drawings to win things. I had a, a foundation there, um, Hope for Heroes. Um, no, um, anyways, I had a foundation there raising money for them. People could bring money or bring food to donate for blessings and a backpack. So I, I turned it into, this is an open house, but there's food, there's music, there's um, purpose. And I was so nervous. I was not really known in the industry, which is my first big listing. I didn't have a whole lot of money to throw at this, but I got some sponsors. And again, you have to spend money to make money. And I think that that open house is what elevated my business to more luxury listings. The, they saw how much time and effort I put into that. And just the recognition I got in that million dollar house, the mayor of Bernie came out. Um, at that time. So I had the, you know, a step and repeat when people arrived with a photographer. And I really think that that's what boosted my career. I, so really, I actually lost that listing later. <laughs> it never sold. Um, I'll be very honest. Um, but that listing really is what helped me get to where I am today. And really what you hosted was an event, mm -hmm. not, not just an open house, but I loved how you incorporated things into it, like a charitable organization, a couple of different charitable organizations, sounds like, uh, where people were invited to bring things that then got donated to the charities. And again, uh, I think I commend you on, on always thinking a little bit outside the box and thinking on how to do things a little differently, but also thinking in terms of how can I pay this back? How can I give this back? Uh, to the community and at the same time uh, be marketing uh, a property. Well, I'm sorry that listing didn't sell, but obviously that springboarded you into uh, other wonderful listings later on. Um, and I encourage our, our listeners to go to your website. The, the, the marketing photos that you are using are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so I'm assuming you use a professional photographer uh, for those. Uh, can you speak just a little bit about that and what you would do if you do something differently for a multi-million dollar property versus what you would do for something that is less than 500,000, for instance? Sure. Um, so professional photography on everything. The, the first time someone sees your listing is on the computer. And if that um, presentation is not good, then you've ruined your first impression. You've lost that opportunity. And it is good photography costs a lot of money. And I don't care because it truly good photography, videography and marketing is what has made me be able to make money. So um, now regarding price point, I always do. I have a really great photographer for 200,000, 500,000 million, 2 million. So I don't, I don't save money on photography 
depending on the price point. However, videography. Typically, videography comes 900000 and up because uh -huh. um, it's necessary for those houses. It's not typically necessary for the more affordable homes. Doesn't mean I won't do that, but typically... Generally speaking, under half a million, I'm not going to do a video a video on that house. Um, okay. If it's needed, I will. Yeah, but you're still using professional photography regardless of the price point. Uh -huh. um, I think that's important for our listeners to note is that uh, what you say, you've got to spend money uh, to make money, and you really do need to have a marketing budget and know what it's going to be costing you uh, for each and every listing that you take. Um, mm -hmm. And we've had that we've had the the good fortune to uh, to have uh, listings that are selling very quickly. Uh, but now the market is starting to slow down a little bit. Uh, we don't know how much slower it may get. Uh, that remains to be seen, uh, and everything. And that that is based upon so many different factors with the economy and interest rates and uh, the number of buyers in the marketplace and everything. Uh, but um, you always have to be willing to shift some of your focus. But at the same time, you still have to, if you have promised you're going to market a, a listing, you've still got to do the necessary things to market it. Uh, even if that, even if you suspect that property will sell pretty quickly, um, uh, you can't, I think that is the difference between being a professional and someone who's trying to just save money. If they think it's going to sell fast, they won't do the things that you would normally do. Uh, but would you agree that your marketing is something, and I love the way you presented it because you said on the internet, that is the first impression. Mm -hmm. So that is something uh, we call it your, your, uh, your electronic uh, persona today uh, is that that is the first impression people get of you and you need to make it the best impression that they can have. That's right. So, well, and another uh, way to look at professional photography is, not only are you spending that on that listing, that's forever marketing. So you can use yeah. those photos forever. So it's actually an investment you're making into yourself for future postcards, print magazine, Instagram posts. Just because you sold it two years ago doesn't mean you can't use that same photo two years later to market yourself. That's right. Uh, particularly if your contract allows you to own those photos yourself because you paid the photographer. That's super advice um, and all. Uh, speaking of advice, let me just ask you this, uh, because you gave a little bit of advice already to somebody uh, that was uh, uh, starting uh, their career. What about somebody that's sort of already in the, the marketplace, but they're sort of a middle of the road uh, producer? Is there any advice that you would give them uh, to try to take their uh, production to sort of the next level? Yes, um, a couple of things. I think one, I think it's super important to brand yourself. Um, not every brokerage loves a personal brand, so you need to find a brokerage that aligns with that. Um, but the brokerage is important too. So if you have a strong brokerage and then a great brand, that's really, and if you're, if you're kind of middle of the road producer right now and you're maybe with one of these virtual brokerages and you're wondering why haven't you taken it to the next level, it's probably because you need to find a brick and mortar brokerage, someone that can actually help you, can pick up the call and answer your questions or meet with you. So I think that um, maybe a change into a more local plugged in brokerage is um, one thing you can do. And I think another thing is maybe you're stuck in a rut because of you haven't Put yourself out there very much you haven't spent a lot on marketing you don't have a dedicated instagram or facebook page that really lets people know what you do because if you don't do that nobody's going to know and they're going to call the next person that might be your friend that's a realtor because you're not letting them know enough that you sell real estate and i think um the third thing is you don't ever know everything i don't know everything and if you don't know something don't be afraid to admit it if someone asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I don't pretend. I tell them, you know what? That's a great question. And I'm going to find the answer out. I'm going to call my attorney at Phyllis Browning and I'm going to ask him um, or call our um, 
or education department. I'm not afraid to admit when I don't know something. And I think that that is what takes you to the next level because then I'm always learning. You have to learn every day. Uh, yeah, learning is continuous and there's power uh, in education, as we say here at Champions. So that that gave me a good segue. I appreciate that. Uh, and I encourage, I encourage our listeners to uh, uh, take other classes um, and everything. And for uh, for some of the people that are new um, c coming into the business, uh, Rita's uh, book, uh, 30 Days to Success, is an excellent way for you to learn a step-by-step -step approach uh, to how to start your career off on the right foot. But as Tamara mentioned earlier, one of the things is finding the right brokerage. For those of you that are out there just taking classes, you need to interview several different companies and find a brokerage that's going to be supportive and give you that extra training that you need to kickstart your career and know then as you're in your business, as you're getting more into your business, um, you may want to invest in a coach even sometimes or have a good mentor, one of the other. So Tamara, have, do you have a coach or uh, who do you rely upon uh, whenever you have questions uh, about maybe, you know, what to do next uh, mm -hmm. with someone? Great questions. I, I don't have a coach and, you know, I follow a lot of people on social media that do have a coach. Um, so, but I do have questions, right? So I call, I use my brokerage. I use our in-house attorney and you know what? I probably, if he's watching this, he's probably like, she calls me too much. It's because I never want to make a mistake. Sometimes I know the answer, but I call him anyway. Um, but other seasoned agents, my peers, I might, have a question and I'll call them and say, Hey, this is going on today. What would you do? Am I doing the right thing? And they might sell more than me. They might not sell more than me. I don't, it doesn't matter. It's just my peers that I trust and I look up to and that's who I bounce ideas off. And, and um, but if it's a, if it's, if it's a crucial question, I'm always calling our in-house attorney. And it's good to have an attorney that you can turn to because uh, we all occasionally need to know from a legal standpoint, um, you know, exactly what is the best course of action. Um, and sometimes the best course of action is to go back and talk to your broker. Or mm -hmm. if you have the luxury of being with a company that has an in-house attorney, talk to the in-house attorney. Uh, the brokers have those people uh, uh, on retainers or whatever for that purpose so that uh, so that there is someone that can give you that uh, sort of legal answer uh, when things become a little bit sort of questionable. Well, uh, well you know, one thing I want to say about calling an, a manager or an in-house attorney is I like to know why. I don't want to just get the answer. I want to know why, because if I understand the why, I'm either not going to do it again or it's just going to help me better understand moving forward. So that's why I want to get into the nuts and bolts of the answer. Don't just give me the answer. Tell me why. Help me understand it. Well, you learn more by getting the reasons behind why something is the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I appreciate you saying that. And um, it is good to always dig a little bit deeper to understand why. And those are the types of questions we should all ask. Uh, our brokers and the attorneys, because we know they can give us answers, but explore, you know, what is the reasoning behind that? How can I, how can I understand it better so that I can go back and explain it uh, without giving legal advice maybe to my client? Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what we have to do. Um, one just sort of final uh, question for you, because I, I see by the clock, we're almost running out of time, but I wish we could just talk to you for the next uh, couple of hours uh, and everything, because uh, we appreciate you being with us. And you certainly have given us some good insights uh, for people uh, that are looking uh, at coming into our industry and for those that are already in the industry as well. Um, but uh, let me ask you uh, uh a question about um, if you uh, uh, were to be starting over uh, today, uh, what is some advice that you would give your younger uh, self? 
if you were just starting in the business today? Um, if I started today, I would, um, I would join a team and that would cost money, but I would join a team to learn. That's the quickest way to learn. That's when I really started learning is when I was going into the office and I wasn't on a team, but I was picking the brains of my, the other people in the office. Um, and then I think um, one thing that I, I haven't said yet that I think is so important is don't sell real estate to be number one. Don't sell real estate because you're focused on the volume and the production. Sell real estate because you actually enjoy it and be good at it because then the rest will come. When people ask me what my production and my volume is, I don't know the answer because I don't know. I don't keep track of that. That's not what drives me. So really hone in on why you chose to sell real estate. And then if you do good at that and you learn and you focus on your clients, the rest comes. So join a good brokerage, probably join a team and really just you know, put yourself out there. And I think branding from day one is super important. Well, Tamara, we certainly appreciate you being with us today. And I know that our listeners have learned a lot uh, that can help them uh, with their own real estate uh, career. So on behalf of uh, Rita Santa Maria, the founder and owner of Champions and Kim Didalowitz, our president and co-owner, um, I just want, and all of us here at Champions, uh, I have the uh, grand opportunity to be part of the Champions team. And I was thrilled that Rita asked me to uh, fill in for her today uh, with this interview. And I'm so happy that you were, you made the time to be with us. Okay. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much for all of your insights and uh, appreciate you so much and all that you do to get back to your community there in Bernie. Um, one, one final note. Uh, just to remind everyone, <clears throat> Rita has been doing these uh, superstar interviews uh, for quite some time. And she has already written two books. Uh, the two books are a compilation of those interviews. Uh, and so we have book one and two. Uh, you can order these online uh, from championschool.com. Uh, you could also um, stop by one of the campuses and pick up uh, a copy of the book. They make great gifts. Uh, if we have managers uh, on board, they make great gifts for your um, agents and all. And these are from previous superstar interviews. And I might also add that we also uh, have our YouTube channel where you can go back and you can watch any of the previous superstar interviews that uh, Rita has conducted over the years. I'm sure Tamara's interview and excerpts from her interview will be part of an upcoming book at when Rita uh, compiles um, enough of our superstars uh, to have the next uh, uh, the next issue of the book, the next one in uh, this whole group of books. Uh, so again, on behalf of all of us here at Champions, uh, we wish all of you the best in your business. Uh, we thank you uh, for attending. And uh, I know that our classes are ready to get back to class, uh, but I just want to say uh, from the bottom of our heart, uh, thanks for Tamara and her time today and thank each of you for being a champion. So thanks very much for being with us. Thank you.